Welcome everybody, I'm glad to start this uh, first panel uh, with the uh, European Space Generation Workshop 2021. I'm glad to have all the uh, all of you following this exciting session. Um, we will now uh, hear about the quantum technologies and its importance, uh, also the importance of quantum experiments when performing in space together with uh, a very exciting list of panelists and uh, as the topic is uh, space for humanity i am very glad to in to inform you that we will hear today about uh, uh, astronomy quantum technologies for astronomy quantum technologies for earth observation quantum uh, quantum technologies for so many applications that are relevant uh, for us uh, let me start by introducing myself this is sana pika from the program team and i am also project leader at the european photonics industry consortium and uh, let's start with the round of uh, introduction of our uh, speakers here in the room. Let me first uh, share with you the list of our speakers. We will uh, we have uh, Dr. Aline uh, Deacon Laka from uh, Leibniz Institute uh, for Astrophysics in Boston. Aline, how are you doing today? Thank you very much. I'm very well. Um, I'm very happy to be on the panel here today. And uh, just a few words about myself. So my background is in lasers and photonics um, for quantum technology as well. So I was working on stabilized frequency references before, and now I'm working on astrophotonics, which is the interface between photonics and astronomy. Thank you so much, Aline. Uh, the, uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Carsten Pika from OHB. Kasten, can you say, uh, tell us a word about your background and uh, wh what you do? Yes, hello, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's great to be on the panel today. So, yes, um, I am a system engineer at the OHB System AG, one of the, um, one of the biggest German um, space companies. And yeah, because of my background and my interest in quantum technologies, um, I'm happy to uh, be sharing some thoughts on uh, quantum technologies and industry today. Thank you so much. Uh, the next, just as uh, the random order on my slide here, Nasser, uh, Dr. Nasser Galul from uh, the Institute of Quantum Optics in Hanover. Yeah, hi everybody. So my name is Nasser Galul. I am uh, working at the Institute of Quantum Optics, as Sana said. Uh, my expertise is um, using quantum gases uh, in sensing, so in inertial sensing or sensing of uh, different kinds of forces, um, mostly for uh, detecting or testing uh, fundamental principles, for example, of physics. And I'm involved in several space missions uh, on sounding rockets on the ISS or on satellites. Thank you so much, Nasser, for being with us today. Uh, our next speaker is actually from the industrial world, uh, but also a, a, a very famous scientist from uh, NIST. Uh, John, thank you, John. Sorry, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here today and uh, talk about quantum technology and space. So, my background is uh, sort of atomic, quantum, and laser physics. Um, but right now I'm doing things with lasers and the CEO of the startup company, uh, MicroR Systems, where we're really focusing on developing the next generation lasers that are needed for a range of um, space applications and quantum technology in the future. So I'm happy to talk a little bit about that in a, in a few moments. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we close the circle of introduction with the Professor Dr. Oliver uh, Bushmiller from uh, CERN uh, and from the Imperial Colleg uh, College of London. Uh, would you like to uh, tell us a word about you, Oliver? Sure, again, thank you for the introduction and being here today. So yeah, I'm a professor at Imperial College in Physics, but I'm also working for over 20 years at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN. And I'm currently spearheading a new quantum technology program for fundamental physics. Fundamental physics on terrestrial, but also in space. And I hope I can talk a bit more about it later in the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all of you for joining us today. So let's start with the uh, 
reminding everybody the focus of this European Space Generation Workshop for this year, which is uh, Space for Earth and the Humanity. Uh, we have an audience of uh, young uh, uh, scientists and uh, space enthusiasts. Many of them are fascinated by the uh, quantum technology and is fast growing right now, quantum sensing, quantum communication, and quantum computing. And uh, we want to show the the use of these quantum technologies in space and how is it growing and how is it having a lot of interest. And when we say space, maybe one of the first applications that come in mind is uh, the astronomy. And we heard about one of the uh, um, big achievements in, the, in these last years, the, uh, the picture of the, uh, um, the black hole. Aline, you are an uh, expert in uh, astronomy and senior scientist at Leibniz Institute for Astronomy, Astrophysics in Potsdam. Can you tell us a word about how can we use quantum experiments uh, uh, in space for astronomy? Sure. Um, I would like to introduce the concept of astronomical interferometry um, to those of you who have not heard of this, which has also contributed to this famous um, black hole image that you can also see at the bottom of the slide. And um, you might also know the term stellar interferometry from the um, from the results that have contributed to the Nobel Prize in physics last year as well. So astronomical interferometry allows to produce very high angular resolution images by not directly imaging a star or an astronomical object, but instead um, to take several telescopes that are distance B apart and interfering the light from these two telescopes. This way you get an interference pattern um, which you can look at and extract the visibility. And this gives you a measure of the coherence of light, which in itself is already a quantum property also, um, and connected to quantum optics. But the, um, the requirements on quantum technology I will come to on the next slide. By taking this interference pattern, you can increase the resolution compared to a single telescope, since for a single telescope, the resolution is determined by the diameter of the telescope. And of course, there's physical limitations as to how large you can make a single telescope dish. And for this baseline, for this distance between several telescopes, you can go to the order of tens or hundreds of meters on ground. And space might offer the opportunity to even go to the kilometer range. And by, um, by changing this distance, you can increase the um, angular resolution since this is what it depends on. So larger distances will increase your angular resolution. And on ground, um, this was actually the very first direct measurement of a diameter of a star 100 years ago. And in the optical and near infrared, you can, for example, see here from the um, Chara array, the stellar surface of Altair. So no direct imaging can produce such resolutions of the surface of a star. And of course, for the, um, for the black hole image, that you can see at the bottom, which has been uh, going around the world and is very famous. This was done in the radio frequency. And for radio frequency, you can span the whole globe with the network of telescopes and produce very, very high resolution images from thousands of kilometers of baseline. Thank you so much, Aline. Uh, I'm afraid your picture is a little frozen, so maybe uh, we get back to you in a minute. Uh, we stay in the topic of uh, Earth observation and uh, another Nobel Prize winning, which is on the gravitational wave detection and some quantum experiments. Yeah. Ah, you're back. Yeah. You're back. Oh, sorry. The, um, so the, the data was saved on hard disks and then transported to locations in order to correlate and get this interference pattern. So this is not possible for near infrared or for optical. But I would like to talk to you a bit or introduce some concepts um, that require quantum technology that might allow similar approaches than the one that's possible in radio astronomy. So one concept is heterodyne interferometry, where you take a local oscillator, which could be a frequency stabilized laser or a frequency comm, and you then overlap the light from the two telescopes on satellites and basically imprint the phase of your starlight onto a resulting beat node radio frequency system um, signal, which you can then digitize and record and also bring to a different location, for example, a third satellite to uh, correlate and get interference. 
So you do the same thing with a second telescope, again, get the radio frequency signal, you can digitize, record, store, and correlate later. So for these applications, you need um, stabilized lasers in space in order to do so, and also frequency comms to get higher bandwidth. This idea has been around for a while, and I must admit that no space interferometer has yet um, we have been realized in the optical and near infrared just because there's so many technical challenges. But maybe these quantum technologies, if they get a bit more developed and space qualified, um, they might help to realize these things. Secondly, this idea is quite um, novel and a bit more futuristic. It's only been published on archive a couple of months ago to um, utilize some of the ideas from quantum communication, quantum networks, namely quantum memories, which take crystals as storage of phase or amplitude of light, um, and then basically take the two telescope lights, store the information, including the phase, on a quantum memory, transport the quantum memory like a hard disk to a different location, read it out, and then obtain the interference pattern. And for this, the quantum technology required is the, um, the storage medium, so the quantum memories, which could be crystals, and high-Q optical cavities. In general, for all these applications, of course, there's a lot more requirements. We need photonic components, like the ones I'm working on as well, astrophotonics. We need very precise satellite orientations, controlled environments, and low-power consumption electronics. These are the um, challenges that we are still facing, but quantum technology will play a major role in this, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aline, for this uh, um, excellent overview uh, on this astro interferometry and the quantum memory. This is quantum memory in space. It's also highly relevant for quantum communication. And I, and I understand now why we you ask it backstage about that because there is uh, always room for collaborations uh, between institutes uh, in this uh, regards and uh, industry, of course. Um, again, another hot topic, as I said, when it comes to uh, Nobel Prizes winner, the latest Nobel Prize winner uh, on uh, gravitational wave uh, waves detection and if you want to detect the dark matter in space or gravitational waves there is quantum solutions for that and we are very happy to have uh, um, the professor oliver today with us uh, would you like to tell us uh, a word about uh, this um, about what can be done as quantum experiment in space for for earth observation i would be very happy to would you be able to share the slide for me which yeah, i gave um, you or uh, I, I will do that, but if you can tell us first what, what, sure. what kind of collaborations are existing on that. So, I mean, so the idea behind, and it's relatively new, it's, as a matter of fact, relatively similar to what Aline was already presenting, the idea of using interferometry. But here the idea is not to use light interferometry, but rather atom interferometry, which is a real quantum sensor. So we are replacing the active element of light, laser light, with atoms in order to accomplish the same thing. It's a relatively new technology environment, which we have identified to have very interesting applications for fundamental science on Earth, but also in space. And not only for science, but also eventually then for technology, which is very interesting. And for that reason, if the slides are coming up, um, we have been starting to build an international community. And there was a first workshop in 2019 at CERN CERN is a particle physics laboratory, it usually has nothing to do with uh, um, quantum technology, nor has it anything to do with space. However, the driver here was the idea of fundamental physics. And we wanted to essentially establish a new paradigm of using quantum technology to go after very important fundamental physics questions, namely the idea of exploiting gravitational waves as a tool to understand the, the early universe, to search for dark matter and for dark energy. So these are the three main drivers. Uh, so this workshop took place in 2019. If you can go to the next slide, if that's possible. Um, it was quite successful to our surprise because it's different communities you have to bring together. On one hand, you have the people coming from the quantum world. Then you have people coming and having an interest to exploit this either on Earth or in space. And then you have essentially people with my background of fundamental physics. So we had more than 130 participants initially, and we were really bringing together, I think for the first time, these different uh, communities to start discussing and providing, if you can go to the next slide, um, a white paper, which outlines a mission concept. 
and that has been quite successful. And I'm giving you here the link. It's also published in Quantum Technology. So it's really a white paper outlining an idea in more details to establish an L mission, an L, uh, a large mission concept to measure gravitational waves and potentially to search for dark energy and dark matter by utilizing a quantum sensor. And um, that has been published and has also been submitted uh, to the Voyage 2050 a review of ASA and it's currently under review and we are eagerly awaiting an outcome of that um, process in, um, I think it's in June or, or July. If you can go to the, the next and, and final slide, I'll show you a quick outline of how this looks like. So it's, it's really relatively simple. The idea is that you have two satellites which are connected by uh, one laser beam and this is now a laser beam so essentially uh, establishes a clock and a common reference frame and in each of these satellites, you're operating a quantum sensor. And this quantum sensor will then be sensitive to potentially a gravitational wave penetrating through that satellite or a dark matter halo penetrating through that satellite. And by comparing the two satellites and quantum sensors via these laser beams, you will have very high sensitivity towards these fundamental effects. And that is the current concept which we have been outlining. And as I said, it has been in review uh, by ESA, and we, we are waiting for the outcome of that review uh, by summer. I leave it here. Thank you so much, Oliver. Uh, that was a very exciting project that uh, I myself was in the kickoff uh, meeting for this uh, uh, white paper. Um, and I really wish you all the success uh, following up that experiment. Now we heard about some of the fundamental physics research and uh, Maybe when you hear about gravitational waves or detection of a, a, a black hole that does not connect directly to what we do in every day, but actually quantum experiments are also used for uh, more uh, human related applications uh, for our everyday life. And uh, some of the proof is that, the, that some of the biggest companies are now working on realizing quantum uh, sensing experiments in space. For this, I have in the room two uh, uh, representatives of the industrial world, uh, the company Micro R uh, Systems, um, represented by uh, John Yost here, and the company OHB, uh, represented by Kasten Pikak. Kasten, if we start with you, what kind of, what is the overview, for example, in your company? What are the applications or the technologies you use uh, as quantum technologies for space? Can you give us an overview about what OHP is doing there? Yes, thank you. So first of all, uh, OHP, as you may have heard, is a quite large company that, uh, yeah, um, that is, 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 is working through the whole range of space applications, yeah, from um, satellites um, to scientific or communication payloads uh, to human space flight, um, so the whole range that you, you can imagine. And of course, um, since now the 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 increasing interest and the increasing development in quantum technologies uh this is also something that uh that we are yeah quite curious about and uh want to be part of the part of the uh um part of the excitement uh, of, of of course uh, very well yeah um early on if possible and um so just to give you an overview on the possible applications um, that uh, we are currently also looking at uh, at OHB in terms of uh, business development and, and networking and, and um, um, becoming part of, of, of communities, of course, the relevant communities. Um, yeah, just to, and, and also we have uh, we have several ongoing projects in, 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 in several domains. Yeah, and, and of course the three main domains that we are uh, that are, we are looking at uh, is, uh, for one thing, the quantum key distribution, where you will have uh, um, applications and communication, uh, not only communication but also the secure communication, which is uh, which will be um, future proof with the advent of uh, quantum computers that will become within the next uh, um, years. Um, of course, and more generally in safety, and cybersecurity, but also in defense and um, Looking in the other domains, uh, uh, now we're going to um, we're going to cold atom-based um, applications, right? So on one side, uh, one big topic uh, is the sensing, 
and we have heard uh, something uh, of that already and there's uh, like a, a big interest in um, developing technologies for earth observation utilizing these uh, um, cold atom sensors but of course uh, the the yeah the first uh, things that usually come to mind are um, um, fundamental research and, and, and scientific discoveries um, within this new environment and also um, using the advantages of going to this uh, new environment yeah? um, another more practical application uh, possibly is also international navigation um, atomic clocks which of course are also part uh, of cold atom sensors uh, are very useful uh, again also in science um, and uh, of course in uh, navigation and uh, network all kinds of network um, applications uh, Kasten, Kasten, yes. if i can if i can um, interrupt you here because you um, spoke about cold atoms in space and we cannot mm -hmm. speak about cold atoms in space because without uh, here in the world from Nasser uh, here, because uh, we hear that the, uh, we know about the experiments happening in space. Nasser, can you tell us a word about the, the cold point in space or about your experiment that you have been involved with uh, as Hanova in, um, in, Germa, in general? Sure, yeah, that's, uh, I can do that with pleasure. Uh, maybe for the audience, I mean, if you can see my slide, I don't know. Yeah, we do, we do. You do, okay. Then um, maybe taking a step back and um, thinking about why we need uh, these code atoms in space, actually. Um, so what? Uh, I, it's not a presentation, so I just wanted to give you a flavor of how a quantum sensor is working. Yeah. So what happens here is you take an atom. Yeah. It's really here an ensemble of code atoms. So we are talking about temperatures which are in the range of um, micro K, micro Kelvin to nano Kelvin or even below. And uh, we are taking these atoms that are super cold thanks to the, uh, as you know, to the de Broglie wavelength, uh, they would be having a, a wave character. So we are creating a superposition of two matter waves here using laser light to split them. Uh, so what we do is we do the equivalent, for example, what's depicted here is the equivalent of a Machtsender interferometer for light. And this is all spanned by, by uh, an atomic uh, wave, which we, as I said, split, uh, mirror, and recombine at the end. And uh, this is now how basi the basic, uh, let's say, way um, a quantum sensor is working. And uh, when I'm saying it's sensing something, it means that if, for example, this upper path here is uh, seeing some other, uh, let's say, phase shift. Yeah? Imagine there's a force here that pulls the atoms a little bit more than the down ones yeah? than in this, in this path. Then uh, I would be able to record this sensitivity here at the end while, while looking at my atoms. And this sensitivity would be um, immediately proportional to the momentum that I would imprint on my atoms with my uh, light momentum here, the K effective that you see there. But more importantly, this area that you see here, which basically um, is, uh, is my sensitivity, is um, proportional to the time to the square. And time is, T is half of the time the atoms spent there. And here you see why we need to go to space, actually. It's because we want to have this time here uh, unlimited. Yeah? So if I have atoms on ground, uh, let's say conversely to a light interferometer, for example, for example, atoms have a mass and they would be pulled in the gravity field and your experiment will not be able to perform more than a couple of um, hundred milliseconds, let's say. And uh, by going to space and having the atoms just on a satellite, for example, freely floating, I can, in principle, increase this, this time to several seconds, several tens, hundreds of seconds. And this is exactly the first, let's say, the most obvious need for space that we have here. So and that's why we are so excited about having these um, cold quantum gases in space. What you see in the picture here is exactly an experiment showing this. So this comes from an experiment what you are seeing is a Bose-Einstein condensate here and being split and spanning this mach sender surface that you see there. And you see here beautiful quantum interference fringes 
that you could read out and uh, get to the uh, to to the extract. For example, if you are in the gravity field, extract the, the value of uh, g, or it can it can you could um, build any configuration in principle and be sensitive to lots of forces. So. The domain of applications of all of this that was uh, already highlighted by Carsten is kind of really important. Uh, and um, there are several uh, fields that could benefit from it. Uh, maybe uh, you asked me for, for my, my expertise. So we are focusing on uh, detecting, uh, for example, fundamental interactions or testing fundamental laws. For example, testing the equivalence principle of Einstein that everybody um, is expecting it to be violated at some point and this is why we are for example we have been very active um, in preparing mission concepts like the ste quest mission it's a satellite mission with two um, atomic species where we compare their free fall and we try to test by that uh, the universality of free fall so we've been um, actively uh, doing this it's of course uh, kind of a hard endeavor because uh, if you ever have been at a university or in an institute and saw a cold atom experiment, uh, you'd see that that fills quite of a room, yeah, with uh, table uh, tables uh, full of optics and so on. But uh, it's getting way way better. So uh, we've been able to um, send relatively compact devices on sounding rockets uh, to space demonstrate the first Bose-Einstein condensate there two years ago. And right now there is um, a NASA mission called Code Atom Lab Cal on the ISS, which is the first orbiting uh, at cold atom lab, basically. Uh, and we are also part of that uh, endeavor and uh, measuring uh, every day, basically. Uh, we're doing quantum uh, physics uh, in space remotely from the ISS and there will be a successor of that uh, very soon, which is uh, a German American uh, mission called BCAL uh, funded by NASA and uh, DLR. So things are moving on pretty quickly there. And um, I think the cold atoms are getting in the field. So I'm, I'm probably not the best to ask about uh, field applications for geodesy or um, other, uh, let's say, uh, sensors. Um, I, I leave it to, to my colleagues present here. Uh, the last slide I would like to show is um, also uh, talking about these fundamental forces and so on. Why is space so important here? It's because if I am, for example, interested in the gravity field here, yeah, as, as the gravity acceleration, and if I am in space, that offers us um, a very unique laboratory, actually, to, to, to be sensitive to a force and to have a modulation of that force. So for example, if I keep the axis of my sensor, uh, like in, in this is called um, um, inertial pointing, so I keep it constant, you could very easily see that here I have a maximum of a projection of G on the axis of my sensor. Here it's zero, here it's again maximum, but it's a little bit far away and so on. And this. Uh, modulation signal that I will measure is kind of unique and uh, can can allow us to exclude and reject a lot of other um, effects that would otherwise happen due to the experiment itself. So we are doing metrology business here. We are talking about extremely tiny forces. So if I'm talking about the universality of free fall, I'm talking about comparing the acceleration of two isotopes to the 10 to the minus 15 level. And so we are really sensitive to everything that could happen on the apparatus and such a lab offers us the possibility to exclude a lot of effects and to be more accurate. And um, I think with this, I hope I gave you a little bit of a flavor of what we are doing. That was uh, excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Nasser. And you said very important things. Uh, you mentioned uh, the challenges in terms of uh, uh, maybe photonic solutions to realize such projects in space and how 
to bring a lab into uh, uh, small units of uh, device. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing is the collaborations between the institutes. And this is uh, one of the questions we got already. But uh, let's uh, uh, finish the thought uh, or, or the overall view about this uh, quantum technologies in space. I finish the discussion with the, um, with Kasten and John, and then we will start to get in. Uh, I will start be pushy and ask for all the secrets, how you can succeed such collaboration and how can you uh, get solutions um, from the market, what kind of maybe of the chef components that are missing for you um, for the realization of such projects. Um, Kasten, you told us about uh, cold atoms and I interrupted you because I thought it was the best moment uh, to hear the uh, scientific background from uh, Nasser. Um, I would like to ask now, what is what are the experiments that uh, are in the scope of OHP to be realized in space. So yes, thank you. And it was actually uh, it was actually a quite good uh, interruption to to explain <laughs> this uh, uh, the the fundamental principle behind it um, because I think then it also uh, it shares a bit more light on 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 what uh, what real world applications there are. I mean, for us as a space company, uh, of course, we are very interested in, in joining scientific missions which usually is, is how it starts when there's some new technology coming up and uh, you're looking for applications and uh, yeah if it goes into space then of course the technology itself has to be developed and uh, this is one of the big challenges uh, one of the biggest challenges at the moment for for quantum technologies uh, in space um exactly but uh, uh, aside from that, of course, uh, as, as an industry, we also have to look a bit more long-term um, um, yeah, revenue streams and business cases, right? So I just want to point out this one particular example here of using cold atom sensors for um, Earth observation, yeah, because this is something that uh, is potentially interesting for us uh, in the long run, right? So as, as NASA has already explained, uh, we use these, uh, in this case, MetaWave uh, interferometers in order to read out um, the signal that you want to measure and uh, in this example it would be the, the the gravity field of the earth and then by uh, of course uh, looking at uh, modulation and changes of of this put, uh, of this uh, gravity field you will be able to extract uh, other informations uh, um, about the structure of the earth if you basically right mm -hmm. and there are already other methods uh, uh, employed for these measurements but of course with the with these new technologies we aim at uh, improving improving the information we can get by by complementing these different methods right and uh, now potential business cases uh, so real practical applications which i think is also um, uh, nicely within the frame of uh, uh, of of this of this uh, panel discussion or of this this workshop in general um, because for space uh, um, applications and, and, and humanity. Um, so things that we want to look at uh, with these uh, gravity sensors uh, would be, for example, continuous monitoring of, of mass transport processes. Yeah, For example, uh, how the water is distributed. Uh, so you can look at uh, potential um, um, drought scenarios uh, in, in some regions. Uh, you can look at uh, changes in the cryosphere, which will give you an indication on on effects of climate change, yeah, uh, something more industrial. Uh, maybe, okay, maybe going in, in in a different direction is, for example, also the looking for for oil and looking for um, actually for, for other for other uh, mineral um, resources, yeah? or again something more environmentally focused, uh, the monitoring of volcanic activities. So, so there's definitely. Uh, there's definitely a whole range of, of, of potential um, applications. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Carsten, for this uh, overview. So Earth observation. So there is a question that I would like already to drop uh, to you. Uh, when you are realizing such a project, of course, like you said, you you collaborated with the, uh, the idea of Nasser, but that does it also mean real collaboration between institutes? If I am a student and I would like to work on such a project, for example, do I have to only join OHP or these are multinational programs uh, that you join forces for? Absolutely, you're right. Of course, these um, because these, these projects are really uh, uh, on a massive scale, and uh, even if you are a big uh, in, in industry uh, partner, uh, usually um, 
you will be very careful in taking on on uh, the, the big risks that are uh, associated with these kind of projects because we're dealing here with a state of the art technology that's just emerging um, from scientific labs and coming into uh, into the industrial sector yeah? and tr transitioning uh, technologies uh, in in this way is is usually usually met with a with a with a considerable effort yeah? mm -hmm. um, and yeah particularly in the beginning then uh, these co collaborations with uh, several partners yeah academic as well as as industrial that can really combine their their, their competencies um this will yeah this will lead them to to successful projects mm -hmm. but you collaborate not only with uh, universities but also you collaborate with companies and uh, the photonic companies are now uh, aware of the huge step that is the quantum technology and the industrialization of quantum technologies is taken. Uh, one example we have here is one of the successful examples uh, on photonic company working for the space. Uh, John, thank you for uh, joining us today. And you heard the discussion, so I'm sure you find from every uh, experiment a uh, little business opportunity for, for the industry. Can you tell us what you do at Micro R Systems? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to tell you what we're doing at MicroR. So as I mentioned, we're actually fortunate. We're a startup that's been able to work in, in the space sector. And really the business at MicroR is about lasers. In particular, we focus on making lasers with very, very pure colors, as well as uh, something called a multi-channel laser source, which is referred to as an optical frequency comb, which Elena, Elena um, referred to earlier. So. Oftentimes in space, you, you need lasers with uh, very, very pure colors. And what you can find on the market today is simply simply not, not good enough. But let me take a, a few comments about uh, quantum and, and space. As the, the presenters before mentioned that in quantum technologies and space, there's, there's a few main areas. There's quantum communication, quantum cryptography, entangled photon distribution. Uh, there's also quantum sensing, which ranges from atomic clocks to, to gravity sensors. However, one of the things uh, you may not realize is that at the core of almost all of the quantum space technologies is light, and in particular, lasers. And this is actually one of the challenges going forward is um, how, how we deal with these complex systems. So really here in my few slides and pretty pictures, I wanna talk about why we don't have these quantum technologies in space, what's, what's holding us back. So let me go to the next slide and show you a, a historical photo from back when I was a, a young uh, PhD student. So what you see here, um, as uh, NASA referred to earlier, is uh, the, the mess of optics that is a cold atom lab. So this is the experiment I worked on as a, as a PhD student. This is an ion trap quantum computer, uh, NIST in Boulder, Boulder Colorado. Um, we, 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 see, we see a Nobel Prize winner there. Exactly. So this is my advisor, uh, Dave Weiland, down in the corner. This is a, a very rare photo of him. He was not somewhat uh, camera shy, so you're, you're lucky to see this. <laughs> uh, so what do we have here in this picture besides uh, Dave down here looking at his uh, his favorite lasers? Up in the right, this is actually uh, two atoms. So if you've never seen an atom, this is what uh, they look like. This is two beryllium ions uh, imaged on a special UV, UV camera. So in the middle here, there's a sea of optics. Uh, and on the right, this was our ion trap quantum computer. And on the left, there was another experiment uh, doing a super precise atomic clock. So it's a aluminum ion quantum logic clock. And for uh, Sana, just some uh, reference here. I was working with uh, Sana's uh, thesis advisor back in the day on building all the optics in, in this little corner of the optical table here as well. But from, from this picture, is back in all 2010, this was the sort of state of the art. So now you can start to see why these atomic physics or cold atom experiments have had a challenge getting to space. Um, actually, the atomic physics part is somewhat tractable. It's a small vacuum chamber down back here in the corner, but it's really, really the photonics that uh, is one of the limiting factors. We have made some advancements as a, as a community in, in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, these are pictures on the left here of some commercial systems that can be used for uh, a lot of the, say, the cold atom experiments, such that um, NASA mentioned before. Uh, this is one from Toptica system. This can be a complete um, 
photonic uh, device for a quantum computer or gravity gradiometer. But the problem is, is they're simply on the scale of, let's say, you know, two meters. So they're the size of a refrigerator. And this is problematic for going into satellites. So where things really need to be, uh, and this is uh, what I think will be an enabling step for quantum technology in space, is moving to integrated photonics. Here you can see a photonic chip from UC Santa Barbara where they have integrated photodiodes, integrated lasers, and a lot of the splitters and combiners um, that are needed to uh, simplify these systems. And there's some early steps being, being made in this direction. So I would say this is really one of the challenges to make all this uh, quantum awesomeness realized in space. Uh, and a last fun picture, um, yeah, well, quantum technology still has some bugs to work out. Uh, this was a bug that uh, was often walking around one of our uh, ion trap quantum computing experiments, uh, getting out the mirrors and, and causing causing some problems. So even even quantum computers still have some uh, classical bugs. This is <laughs> this is wonderful. I don't relate to this at all. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is really cool. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for bringing up the uh, the topic of photonic integrated circuits. And uh, this is uh, I'm sure it's like going to be one of the biggest markets for space together with the freeform micro optics and uh, um, integrated uh, uh, electronics as well. And there is a lot of steps that can make uh, a system. That there's a lot of steps to qualify system to be space compatible and compatible for such a quantum experiments. And I believe this can also uh, slow down a little bit the work of physicists who want to just jump up there uh, and realize these uh, fascinating experiments. Um, Kasten, I believe you you can uh, maybe share with us a word on the steps or uh, what is the status of quantum experiments now in, in space? Uh, we we don't hear you. Uh, we we don't hear you. Okay, sorry, I was still muted. No worries. Um, good. So yeah, I mean, this was already kind of mentioned. Um, so this is just another illustration, yeah, um, from the fact that I mentioned that um, really going into space and 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 doing quantum experiments and uh, applications uh, is is really a big technological issue. And and John also pointed it out already again. Uh, um, very very nicely and detailed. Um, yeah. So, but uh, on the left side here uh, of the slide, you can see it's, it's just a little bit uh, illustrated why why this is such a big challenge. Yeah? Because mm -hmm. in the lab, you um, have very well controlled conditions. You have a you have a stable temperature in the room that doesn't fluctuate more than one or two degrees uh, usually, right? You have all the perturbations uh, on your on possible perturbations on your experiment. Uh, you can you can cancel them out uh, as, as as good as it gets, and you can create a really nice and stable environment in order to to do these very first experiments on a on a very fragile system. Um, as a, as a OHP is a, a system integrator, so what what is according to you? And this question actually came to Aline, but I will ask it to uh, all of you. Al Aline, most of the question came to you. I don't know why, but <laughs> this is the case. Uh, I just wonder what what is according to you the experiments that are the closest to be launched in space, so that or the interferometric uh, interferometric uh, experiment that will be soonish that launch uh, into space. So in terms of experiments. Uh, or let's say in terms of um, quantum technology domain, the one that's the furthest in terms of commercialization uh, on Earth as well as in space is, is probably the quantum communication yeah, and the quantum key distribution that is uh, used within that frame. Mm -hmm. um, the cold atom, cold atom uh, um, technology is is uh, relatively to that a little little behind because there's simply more complexity and more technological components that you have to take care of. And uh, there's a great deal of activities uh, in order to push these technologies, as John mentioned, for the photonics, but also for the cold atom sources where you will have, um, yeah, you have your cold atom trap, uh, whether it may be for your neutral atom ensemble or an ion trap. And mm -hmm. also 
they were all uh, wrapped uh, in, inside of a, inside of vacuum um, systems that um, need to be miniaturized and ruggedized. Yeah, and uh, all these components uh, they are they are being developed uh, to becoming more space compatible. And um, yeah, regarding uh, projects, of course, there's not only the pure technological part, but there's always uh, also some. Um, some uh, part where the communities will have to come together and they have to make agreements and uh, they will have to decide on on, on 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 the budget that is actually available and and so there's there's a lot of lot of uh, compromises that uh, that need to be need to be um, um, met and uh, yeah and then of course uh, the people need to keep pushing these projects um but yeah. within within um if it, it's it's hard really to pin it down on in, on a number, but uh, I would expect that within the next um, within the next decade uh, there will be there will be first experiments coming up. Well, actually, I, I was more optimistic. Yeah. I was going to say five years, but actually, <laughs> you know, you can say plus. There's there's a big uncertainty, of course, right? Plus minus uh, a couple of years, depending <laughs> yeah. on depending on what's the general um, situation. Um, Maybe. Uh, so of course, just... first experiments are already in space, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, for example, on the ISS. However, of course, uh, now me as a, as, a, as, a, as a space system engineer, maybe I will have to say it's not entirely space proof because there's one of the big components, uh, namely the, the radiation. That's really a harsh, uh, a harsh environment uh, up in space. And, and yeah, so this is, uh, I, I, and also um, the the thermal environment that uh, that technology is exposed to yeah, can be from very low temperatures to very high temperatures in a short range of time, and in many cycles. And so these yeah. uh, at the ISS, you still have not uh, met the full um, harsh space environment, and that's still missing uh, from a technological point of view. I, I would like to go back to Aline because not only this question, but you also are asked if there is other investigations for for the uh, for the black hole in space or other other investigation using quantum technologies to detect black hole in space? Um, so uh, regarding other quantum technologies for the detection of black holes, I think so, yes. But um, I'm not entirely sure of quantum sensors. Um, I think I read something recently, but I can't give any information about this. But I think quantum sensors, maybe there were some ideas how it could be used. Uh, for black hole and photonic interferometry uh, also um, um no i can't say that much about that unfortunately i mean black holes of course if you have gravitational waves you you are looking at black holes basically so mm -hmm. even a, a laser interferometry like like lisa um or as as you um as we heard earlier the uh, quantum sensor and uh, atomic interferometers atomic. yeah depending on the on the um, frequency of gravitational waves that you could detect maybe um we can hear a bit uh, more from the experts later about this, but uh, depending on that, you can look at um, black hole mergers or um, yeah, other other black hole events. Um, I, I wanted to maybe, if, I, if I'm allowed to, to quickly circle back to this question of when um, experiments are realized in space, because as you also said, there's different stages. So there's, of course, the sounding rockets that we've already heard about from Nasser as well, where quantum sensors have been realized. The ISS is one set, but there's also um, before going to the whole complex experiment on a big satellite mission, that is, of course, a very long-term endeavor, there's also um, small satellite technology demonstrators, which, although controversial because space is getting quite crowded, I think they do have their place in, in, on, these, on the kind of ladder that we have to climb to um, space qualify the different technologies. So they might not be able to perform the complete uh, scientific goal. So they might not be able to do all the detection in the best images, but they will be able to specifically look at certain environmental factors such as radiation, or how does a, a laser, or how does a component, a photonics component, or an interferometer, or a telescope behave in the harsh environment of space. So a small satellite that looks at specific technological um, challenges um, would be a step on, on this way to having the full experiment. Uh, Professor, I uh, thank you, Eileen. Professor Oliver, you said something about this uh, white paper, that there, there was a lot of names there. Uh, and there's yeah. this kind of big scale collaboration. And 
I have a question about that, and I think the question was more directed to you. What are some of the challenges or barriers uh, you faced while collaborating at such big scale? Well, it's it's always a challenge to build a new community um, because you know we all speak different languages. We're used to work in our communities, and if you are bringing together different communities, you have to start learning the language. But this is what I have identified to be one of the big problems we are facing right now when it comes to cold atom technology in space. I mean, there has been a lot of developments in the past 10 to 20 years. They're mainly guided on national level. For example, I'm running a program in the UK of 10 million to develop strontium atom interferometry for fundamental physics, but also for space application. There is one in France, there is one in China, there is one in the US. And what, what we are really lacking is an international coordinated development program for space. And I think this is something we have been pitching to ESA several times now. The community is here now. There is fundamental physicists coming together. There is uh, people interested in the technology coming together. And it would be one of the things we hope ESA is going to pick up in terms of starting to coordinate quantum technology development, in particular in cold atom regimes to to start building up the, the the TRL levels required for space. The US is already advancing into this direction. Um, and at the moment in Europe, I think we are slightly behind that. And it would be it would be prudent to to essentially, you know, come ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the real things which are lacking. There's a lot of activities ongoing. They're simply not coordinated on a European or even international level. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, Nasser, I would like to get back to you. And uh, that was this very interesting experiment on the modulation of the of the signal by doing the quantum experiments in space. And I have one of the uh, delegates asking if these experiments can also run on Earth, um, despite the Earth gravity. And maybe you can explain a little better why the necessity of going to space for doing such yes. experiments. Yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, that wasn't an experiment. Unfortunately, that's still a concept for an experiment. Yeah. So so we we, we think that's uh, one of the biggest uh, advantages being in space. Um, on ground, you could try to mimic that. So you basically need to change the direction of gravity, which is pretty hard. But if you could pack your experiment. Um, in a small rack or in uh, in a, something like the payload of a rocket, as uh, Aline was involved in uh, with the Mayus uh, rocket in Germany, for example, you could take that payload and actually rotate it. Yeah, so you could, for example, have the axis of your sensor completely sa uh, parallel to the gravity field to sense it fully. Uh, but then if you rotate it, you could uh, have a projection of G only on your sensor. So. We could do this, um, and we do this, actually. We see it in the lab. We see exactly that we could modulate these signals. But when you do that, you don't make gravity disappear. Gravity is just entering again in your experiment uh, in the other directions. And it's still pulling your atoms. So you still don't get the advantage of being in space. So what I showed, this like uh, signature or, or this modulation of gravity is really typical for space and one has to be in space uh, to do that uh, so so this is there's no way around that um, unfortunately because uh, <laughs> doing it on ground would be much cheaper and much quicker uh, but um, this is a great opportunity that now things are starting so i agree with oliver that there is not a high level um, coordination let's say between the the programs so we are we are lacking that uh, we feel pretty pretty lucky uh, for example about the german uh, space program that was funding us now since um, almost two decades now yeah which is uh, exactly closing this valley of death that carsten was talking about because <laughs> that in principle is extremely hard for industrials to pay for it because it doesn't have any return. Yeah? So you have to take your TRL, your technology readiness level, from something like four or five to something like seven or eight that you could you could uh, fly. Uh, and this is exactly where we were stuck at. So I'm, I'm just, just to give you an example, um, there was a successful, let's say, coordination um, for, for this UFF mission that I mentioned, uh, the universality of free fall test 
uh, which was called STE Quest. That was in the frame of an ESA medium mission. Uh, so just to give you um, a flavor of that, what Oliver is talking about uh, in this white paper, this is an L mission, so that's a large scale mission. The M missions are a little bit more modest uh, and they mean that ESA is putting something like half a billion euros on the table. Um, but you have to, before it gives you the green light to, to, to fly such a payload, you have to show that uh, your components are somewhere beyond this valley of death. And this was one of the main, um, the main reasons why this mission did not fly, although it was at that time in 2013, quite a big success. So we had um, um, collaborators from all the major uh, countries in Europe that are involved in space. We had even uh, a collaboration uh, with some payload parts from NASA. And uh, that was, from a point of view of the organization, quite successful. However, of course, in 2013, atom interferometry in space wasn't very major as it is today, I think. So, and, and now I would like to come back to a point that people, uh, that, that the colleagues were talking about. Um, I think we can count these experiments on, on, the, on the fingers of a single hand. Yeah? So what happened in space uh, at all with cold atoms? Uh, there was this Mishus experiment by the uh, Chinese uh, colleagues. Uh, it was basically a, a cold atomic clock. There was uh, the sounding rocket I talked about uh, with the Bose-Einstein condensate uh, in Germany. And there was, uh, there is now the cold atom lab uh, by NASA in the ISS. That's all so far. But that we hope is already convincing enough for space agencies to say, okay, we can keep uh, an atom, uh, a cold atom experiment alive for several years, or we can just put it on a rocket, send it six minutes in space, and it works autonomously, and, and things like this. So we are in the beginning of the journey. Yeah, so in, in terms of where we are, we are really at the beginning, but things are really promising. So we don't see a big showstopper saying, okay, no, you could never, for example, uh, send, send this technology in space or so on. But uh, it takes a bit of time. And I think here credit yeah. should be given to the national space agencies for uh, funding continuously and not uh, uh, just uh, sporadically. And, and I think we will be there soon. And it's also to the uh, new startups developing photonic integrated circuits for space, like uh, uh, micro R systems. Uh, and uh, there is uh, also uh, in, in the consortium that I work for, the European Photonics Industry Consortium. You can um, also reach out if you're looking for more photonic solutions for space, um, that we have this kind of network. We are also pushing forward the industrialization of such systems. Actually, Micro R System is a member um, of uh, EPIC, mm -hmm. the European Photonics Industry Consortium, and you're all welcome to um, join uh, our uh, technology meetings uh, regarding these topics, uh, topics, quantum in general and quantum industrialization in particular. Uh, okay, so uh, we still have a few minutes. I remind you that our audience are young scientists. So I would like to hear from you in, in three words, uh, what can you say uh, each to these young scientists? How can you pursue them to continue in uh, in the quantum field because it's the future. This is what I can say. Because it's custom. Whatever you're doing now in your lab, uh, continue, yeah? Continue, uh, be be curious. Uh, don't be scared to also go into, go into another field if you're interested. But if Aline? Just, just go for it, there are possible, yeah. numerous opportunities. Yeah. The community is really, really great. I mean, you meet the same people on different conferences and it's a very, very interactive, helpful, young, vibrant and uh, a very, very nice community, I must say. Uh, John, you've been a scientist and now an industrial. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would say for the young scientists who are just getting started, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to some of the people like us. I got my start when I was 18, just walking to a professor saying I, I'd like to work on lasers. I knew nothing about lasers and I got my start and I'm still still doing it uh, more than 20 years later. Uh, Nasser? Yeah, I'd say uh, the future is quantum. I think that's that's really true. You should you should really do it. And if you are excited about science, uh, what we do is, I think, is, is the best because it says the frontiers of 
quantum gravity and uh, uh, yeah, space. I dreamed of it when I was a child. <laughs> yeah? So it's, it's just so exciting. And uh, Oliver, as a longer experience in the field? Well, it is an opportunity for anyone who has an interest of doing fundamental science combined with hands-on quantum technology, which will open you the direction in an exciting technology field and in an exciting science field. So I think it's a great opportunity to look into this. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us. Now uh, it's uh, 12 exactly. It's time for a lunch break to the delegates and to the, all the speakers. It was a great pleasure to see my friends and my former colleagues uh, Uh, here and to uh, share with you the importance of uh, going towards quantum, more quantum experiments in space. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Uh, this is Sana Pika from uh, European Photonics Industry Consortium. It was a pleasure meeting you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.